So I assume everyone in here has Durkheim's disease, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> so these are my disclosures. So I, I talked a little bit this morning about research on Durkheim's disease. And I decided to go on to PubMed and just search for papers on Durkheim's disease, um, you know, all of them. I didn't restrict it to any years. And I used the terms Durkheim's disease, Durkheim, and adiposis dolorosa. And there were 183 citations. That's it. So as you all know, Durkheim's disease was first uh, described in 1888. So. We only have 183 publications since that time. So I, I think it's fair to say that uh, Durkheim's disease is underappreciated uh, amongst providers, and it's, it's underappreciated amongst uh, researchers. And there's different types of Durkheim's disease. As I mentioned earlier, you've heard it all, diffuse, nodular, mixed, and lipobesity. And I, I just wanted to point out a little bit of something about the lipobesity. When a woman with lipedema develops obesity, especially on the abdomen, it's not because she's overeating or it's not because she's under-exercising or it's not because she's not trying. It's because the lipedema fat puts her at risk for developing additional fat growth on the body. And that fat growth, um, when it's above the waist, is usually metabolically not good. So um, I hope that there's an understanding that this is not saying, you know, oh, if you have lipedema and you get fat, it's your fault. It's if you get lipedema, you're at risk of growing more fat tissue. And, and we need to address that. We need to figure it out and we need to prevent it because we know that lipedema fat is healthy, insulin sensitive fat, whereas fat on the abdomen tends to be metabolically bad. So this is Dr. Francis Xavier Durkham. And he was an internationally recognized neurologist. He was a pioneer in his field. And he was the first to describe adiposis dolorosa, or uh, a syndrome that we now call Durkheim's disease in his honor. And I wanted to go through some of the um, important statements that he put in his 1892 paper. So this is a paper where he looked at three patients who had Durkheim's disease, and this is uh, after his first paper in 1888. And I think he said some very profound things. So he said, the enlarged tissue makes its appearance in a very irregular way. The nodules are soft at first. They can be deposited in some one situation or perhaps in corresponding places of the upper and lower extremities. And what he means by that is you could get a random lump somewhere on your body, or you can get a lump on your left upper arm, as an example, and there's one on the corresponding left upper arm, right? And a lot of my patients say, look, I have symmetrical lipomas. And that can be a little bit confusing because Madelung's disease can be called multiple symmetric lipomatosis. And so if you're a provider who's not really familiar with Durkheim's disease and you hear, I have multiple symmetric lipomas, that, uh, that might be confusing for them. But um, I think it was really important to, I think it's important to know that these lumps can appear at random or they can appear symmetrically. And Dr. Durkheim said that. And then he said, for a time, the deposit is limited to these original areas. So you get your initial lump or your initial lumps but subsequently, it makes its appearance elsewhere. So once you get your sentinel lumps, you're going to get more. And he also mentioned it can become very extensive. But there are regions of the body that he noted which may exist, which remain permanently uninvaded. So just because you have an area on your body that doesn't have lipomas doesn't mean you don't have Durkheim's disease. And then he said, not only is the development of the enlargement irregular and even capricious, does everyone know what capricious means? It's got its own mind. It's going to do whatever it wants to do. There is, in addition, another important fact to be remembered, and that is at some time or the other, the enlargement is accompanied by pain or other nervous symptom. So non-painful lipomas are not Durkheim's disease. 
you have to have pain or you have to have some other symptom associated with the nervous system, and that is usually a peripheral neuropathy. So he also said, it would seem then that we have here to deal with a connective tissue dystrophy, a fatty metamorphosis of various stages of completeness occurring in separate regions or at best unevenly distributed and associated with symptoms suggestive of an irregular and fugitive, which means transient, irritation of some nerve trunks, possibly a neuritis. Inasmuch as fatty swelling and pain are the most prominent features of the disease, I propose for it the name adiposis dolorosa. So that's how it got its name. Because there are the fatty lumps, and then there was an association with changes within the nervous system. And if you look up fugitive on Google, good luck. It took me forever to find out that that meant transient. It kept telling me about people that were escaping. <laughs> so. My conclusions from those passages which I read are these. One, Durkheim's disease tissue nodules can be on one side of the body or they can be symmetric. Once they start, they can spread and they can become extensive throughout the body. Yet some areas are not affected and the nodules at one time or another become painful, possibly a neuritis, but also possibly a neuropathy. And that doesn't mean if you have a lipoma that was at one time painful, it can now be non-painful, right? And I'm sure um, if you have Durkheim's disease, you know that. And also, from what we read, I think Durkheim's disease is a connective tissue disorder. So I, I showed this earlier. This is a 37-year-old woman. She um, is obese. She has a BMI of 37. She has Durkheim's disease. And this was a biopsy from her right abdomen. I think you can clearly see again that she's got a nice lipoma here. But what do you see most prevalent in that picture? You see red stuff, right? That red stuff is connective tissue. And this connective tissue is uh, firm and thick. And this connective tissue we call spaghetti. So this is very loose. And so when I palpated the lipoma before I removed it, I could move it around. And that's because it's associated with this very loose connective tissue, but it's also embedded in a very thick, firm connective tissue. And then over here, we have uh, some normal, quote unquote, normal fat. And I apologize, this is blurry, but um, I think it kind of gets the point across. Um, here's a piece of fatty tissue. And I think you can see this blob right here. This is connective tissue, and it runs all the way along this lipoma. And you've probably heard that sometimes a lipoma removed from a patient with Durkheim's disease can have a tail. That's the tail. And we now have, I think, four tails. And so um, our job is going to be figuring out what those tails are. And this is a picture of the pathology of that tail. So again, you see the fat glob here, and you see this tail running around it and down. And the way I remove the lipomas is I make a, a small five millimeter punch biopsy because I want the skin, and then I cut under the skin all around on the sides and keep cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting and, cutting and sweating and cutting and cutting and cutting, and cutting, and cutting, and cutting <laughs> until it finally loosens up and then I squeeze at the base of the lipoma and encourage it gently through the hole. Once I'm at the base of the lipoma, I hold it very still and I push down on the skin until I can see the tail. And then I pull that up and then we cut it at the base. And then we clean up any other little rogue lipoma masses that are in the area and then we close. So uh, I think that if we if our surgeons uh, wouldn't mind doing a you know, similar process of gently birthing those lipomas out to, to catch that tail, uh, we can learn more, a lot more about this connective tissue disorder associated with the Durkheim's disease. And this is a picture of just how connected things are. So I am tugging and pulling on that fat. You can see all the connective tissue at the base here. And you can see how the skin is kind of humped up here. I mean, I am pulling, and it will not let go. So, and, and, and th this is not a single you know, nodule. You can see all the little fat lobules here. 
they're all connected to each other like a net under the skin. So when you move your arm, does that net easily flow and move with you? No, it doesn't. It tugs and it pulls and it rips and it tears. And this, these uh, lobules are connected to the skin above it, which is why I have to sit there and cut and cut and cut and cut. And then I can pull it out a little bit and then I got to cut on the sides a little bit more and then I you know, have to get down to that bottom. So it is like a net under the skin. So the naming of Durkheim's disease um, was done actually by the French. So some French writers renamed Adiposis dolorosa Malady de Durkheim in on honor of its discover discoverer. And e English-speaking countries later referred to it as Durkheim's disease. I thought we named it, but no such luck. So I mentioned that Durkheim's disease is associated with uh, nervous systems, or, or Dr. Durkheim did. And so um, we have not published this data, uh, but we did a nerve profile study on uh, the skin of some patients who have uh, Durkheim's disease. And we looked at the, um, the nerve bundle called the SMP. This is just a nerve bundle that runs right under the skin. And then we also looked at uh, another uh, nerve bundle that was actually within the skin. So there's nerves under the skin and they send nerve shoots into the skin and we looked at both of those. And the controls are in blue here. So whether we looked at the fibers uh, under the skin here or within the skin here, you can see that the patients with Durkheim's disease had significantly fewer nerves under the skin and within the skin. And you'd think that's, you know, that doesn't make any sense, right? Wait, we have a lot of pain, but we have fewer nerves. What's happening there? What's happening is that the nerves are dying off. They're dying and they're retracting out of the skin and away from the skin. And when that happens, they're, they're dying, right? they're dying off. These nerves are hyper excitable. So you touch and it's painful. So um, what we need to do, we've got the tissue now, we can do, um, and my patients are um, much better defined now that we have the treat program. So we're gonna look at the nerve profile densities for patients with Durkheim's disease and with lipedema, because I think if you, if you have lipedema, you're also at risk for neuropathy. A lot of my uh, ladies with stage um, three especially say I have, I have numbness I, in, in my feet, or my feet um, really burn. So where can you get nerve fiber testing? Let's say you think that you might have a problem with your nerves and you want to get tested and you don't want to fly to Tucson and be biopsied. So there's a large number of companies who actually do this testing. There's Therapath, Advanced Laboratory Services, the Mayo Clinic does it, uh, Corinthian Reference Lab, and Integrated Physician Solutions. And Blue Cross Blue Shield says this about the testing. This testing is considered medically appropriate if all of the following criteria are met. You have to have symptoms of painful sensory neuropathy. Check. No history of disorder known to predispose to painful neuropathy. So if you, have, you can't have diabetes, you can't have um, a toxic exposure, HIV, celiac disease, or an inherited neuropathy. And physical exam findings have to show no evidence of findings consistent with large fiber neuropathy so that your muscles are involved. So if you no longer have reflexes at your knees or your Achilles tendon, you probably have a large fiber neuropathy and there's no need to go in there and do that biopsy. If you also have reduced proprioception, if you don't know where your fingers or toes are in time and space, that's a large fiber neuropathy. And if you can't feel vibration, that's a large fiber neuropathy. Also, your EMG studies and nerve conduction studies are normal and show no evidence of large fiber neuropathy. I have so many patients with Durkheim's disease who are in severe pain, have numbness, and their EMGs are completely normal. So you can actually look up this criteria online by looking up nerve fiber testing, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and you can find it, or you can actually just watch this over and over until you memorize it. <laughs> and I think there's enough companies your doctor should be familiar or your nurse practitioner or your PA should be familiar with one of these labs. So I wanted to review this paper for you. This is a uh, paper that came out recently, um, Prominent Neurological Involvement in Durkheim's Disease. And I want I to discuss it here because I think we need to understand what kind of patient this is. 
So this is a 52-year-old woman. She had a transient episode of dizziness, or a TIA. This was followed by paresthesias and motor impairment of the left side of her body. So this was a significant TIA. She had a history of a chronic backache since her, she was in her 20s. And when she was in her 40s, she developed these painful lipomas on her body. She had a chronic tension headache, and she was fatigued. She was obese. On exam, she had multiple subcutaneous severely painful lipomas, which they called tumors, ranging in size from two to six centimeters. So she sounds like she has nodular Durkheim's disease. Um, they were on her neck, her trunk, her back, her proximal limbs. Um, on exam, she had a reduced degree of facial expression, so uh, they feel this TIA somehow uh, affected her facial muscles. She was not able to move her eyes normally. She could not do visual pursuit normally. She was very sensitive to sound. She had a very uh, large startle. And they also did some additional testing to check her brain stem, which is where your startle reflex is. She had slow, slurred speech. <laughs> She had rigidity in her arms, so when you tried to pull her arm down, her arms went like this. Okay, so this is a significant uh, issue. She also had a decreased sense of touch. She had very brisk lower tendon reflexes, which is also, if your reflexes are very brisk, brisk that's a, a problem with your long nerves in your body. And she scored poorly on verbal memory tests, attention tests and other executive functions. She was very depressed. She had trouble concentrating. She had apathy and irritability. So a lot, lot going on. And when she had uh, her MRI, she had uh, degenerative changes of the cervical discs in her spine, the vertebral bodies, and her L5-S1 vertebra had shifted on each other. And this is what her uh, brain scan looked like. So in this area of the brain, this is where your basal ganglia are. And you can see these little white spots here um, and dark spots here. It's kind of hard to see, but those are cystic areas. So I have never, ever seen an MRI brain of a patient with Durkheim's disease with cystic areas in the brain. So this is a new one for me, too. And this is her family tree. They found out that in her family, 10 of her family members complained of chronic back pain since their 20s. Uh, they had x-rays, and they found that they had a spondyloarthropathy, so they had shifting vertebrae as well. They had a lot of disc disease. They had a lot of degeneration of the, the little protrusions on the outside of the vertebrae. Um, six of them had painful lipomas. And in all of them, a brain MRI showed similar, although less pronounced, lesions in the basal ganglia. And again, I've never seen that before. So the conclusions for this paper are that in this family and in this young woman, that there were sy systemic features of Durkheim's disease early on, so in her 20s, with spondyloarthropathy, so her, she had degeneration of her, of her spine. And I know a lot of patients with Durkheim's disease have this. And people with Durkheim's disease have risk factors for small vessel disease of the brain. And this, they think, is due to inflammation. And there are these little uh, lipid deposits within the blood vessels, uh, which they described as masses of fatty or lipid material. And these cause a degeneration of the penetrating cerebral vessels because those fatty deposits limit the caliber of those, of those vessels. And so they think that, this, that Durkham, it, in patients with Durkham's disease, you can get a microvascular disease in the brain based on this family. And I will tell you that in other patients with Durkham's disease, I have seen white lesions in the brain. And so there is some ischemia, there is some inflammation going on in those small vessels. So what should you take home from this paper? One, I think you need to quiz your family on any history of spinal problems. I think you need to treat any high, high blood pressure that you have. You need to keep your blood pressure within the normal range. If you have high blood pressure, it tends to uh, cause those ischemic changes in the cerebral vessels. And don't allow your blood cholesterol to be high. So you should consider medications like statins, fish oil, or a low-carbohydrate food plan. And there are some problems with statins, we know. 
Um, statins can put you at risk for developing diabetes, so you need to be very careful and you need to work with a provider that knows statin medications very well. But taking fish oil um, seems to be pretty reasonable and a low carb food plan, which you'll hear about today, is also reasonable. And if you have any of the findings that this woman, young woman has, you should seek help. So I did talk about angiolipomas this morning. I'm not the only one to talk about angiolipomas and Durkheim's disease. This is a paper published in 2015, and you can see that they have a, a robust uh, development of uh, the lipoma, angiolipomas. And in a paper that uh, I did with an, another uh, medical student, Sheila Asari Bediako, back in 2007, 40% of people with Durkheim's disease have angiolipomas even if you don't know it. And here's again that picture of the angiolipoma um, I showed you before, and I knew this woman didn't have angiolipomas for sure. <laughs> she had masses on her legs. She didn't have large, rounded lipomas. She had like a hill. And you know there was a top of the hill, and then you could feel around it, and it was very nodular, and I, I, that was not an angiolipoma. It wasn't blue. I did the biopsy and this is what I got. So um, we do say that angiolipomas are blue when you look at them, and, and I did see a patient today. Um, but it, that's not always necessarily the case. You really need a biopsy to prove whether you have an angiolipoma or not. And when we stain for connective tissue in the angiolipoma, you get blue. And you can see all this blue connective tissue surrounding all the vessels with, the, with uh, blood in them. So. What would you call this? Would you call it a connective tissue disorder? What was that? A mess. A mess. It's a mess. It's a sea of blue. Um, but it, is, it looks like a connective tissue disorder, right? It's not just a disorder of blood vessels. There is a lot of connective tissue in there as well. And then we um, stain for elastin. And this is what normal fat tissue looks like when it's stained with elastin. Primarily, you have elastin associated with blood vessels. And you can see this uh, red elastin all throughout the angiolipoma here. So it is not just uh, collagen. It is also elastic tissue. Again, it, it goes right along with it being a connective tissue disorder. And then when we look at the fat cells themselves in angiolipomas, I've marked where all the adipocytes are here, and these two little adipocytes are dead. So the fat cells are dying off in angiolipomas. This is um, likely a, a little adipocyte that's um, going downhill. And you can see that where these uh, adipocytes or fat cells were before, there's now these big spaces. And you can see these black dots here. Those are immune cells that are in there cleaning up the mess. See, it's cleaning up the mess. And this long tube here is a dead blood vessel. So, and this is where capillaries should be. And you don't see any capillaries there. So this adipocyte is not being fed. And if it doesn't get fed, it's going to die. So we have not only dead blood vessels in angiolipomas, we have dead fat cells. And this is the picture I showed you before with the fibrin clots within the blood vessels. And uh, again, this dead uh, tube vessel with this eosinophil marking long-term inflammation. So what are, what are these fibrin clots doing within these blood vessels? So this is the, a cartoon of how you form a fibrin mesh, starting with fibrinogen. And this fibrin is a globular protein, and it's involved in blood clotting. It's important for blood clotting, especially when you actually have a nick or a ding in a vessel. You've got to clot it off. You've got to fix it. But you're not supposed to block off the entire vessel. So when you block off the entire vessel, you have low oxygen flow to anything in the area, and that's called hypoxia. And we think hypoxia is present in the fat tissue of lipedema as well as Durkheim's disease. And what does the body do when there's hypoxia? It increases the amount of a signal called vascular endothelial growth factor. And what does that do? It stimulates more blood vessels to grow, which is what we want. But unfortunately, the vessels that it grows are leaky. They're not the best caliber vessels that you would want. And so they grow and they're leaky, and then you get 
increase in lymphatics and they're leaky. So you start leaking more fluid into the area which causes hypoxia and the whole cycle continues. We've also uh, found mast cells within the angiolipomas. Mast cells are a type of immune cell and I'll talk about those on the next slide. And they produce VEGF. So we think the mast cells are in there pouring VEGF into these angiolipomas so more vessels will grow to take care of the hypoxia and they're just creating more hypoxia. So how do you treat fibrin clots? There's different ways. One uh, is by doing daily injections with uh, something called anoxaparin. And I actually have somebody doing this right now and he's lost um, an inch and a half of fat and his pain has gone down and he's got more energy. He's not perfect by any means and he'll tell you that, but um, he's doing better. You can also, when you're in the hospital, they inject heparin in, into you, especially if you've had a surgery, That's, that dissolves fibrin clots. Aspirin d dissolves fibrin clots. So taking a baby aspirin a day if, if your doctor thinks that's a good idea. And there's all sorts of oral medications now that dissolve fibrin clots. Coumadin, um, also known as warfarin or rat poison, that um, dissolves fibrin clots. <laughs> so you have to be monitored very carefully. With some of the newer uh, fibrin busting medications, you don't have to be monitored, monitored as often, and those are shown uh, below here. Most insurance plans um, would support you starting Coumadin, and if you failed it, you could go on to one of the others. And then um, I found out that there's a supplement that you can get called natokinase. It's an oral supplement that comes from fermented soy. So it's not soy, there's no estrogen in it. They actually pull that enzyme out of the fermented soy and it's associated with vitamin K. So you don't want the vitamin K with your natokinase because vitamin K increases clotting factors. So um, the, uh, the extract that you get from the soy is called natto. Um, the, em the evidence demonstrating that natokinase is safe is very limited and bold. Um, there have been no adverse reactions reported in human clinical studies, but the number of people taking natokinase in each of those studies was very small, either 15 to 45, and they were on it no longer than seven months. And one study suggested that with natokinase, as with aspirin, as with anoxaparin, as with Coumadin, that you are at risk for bleeding following trauma, um, even if you're an otherwise healthy individual. So if you, for example, are in Coumadin and you fall down and hit your head, you're at risk for bleeding into your brain. If you have um, you know, uh, irritable gums and you take uh, something that dissolves fibrin, you're going to have pretty bloody gums. So that is one of the, the side effects that you have to be aware of when taking these fibrin clot busters. So natokinase is absorbed by the bowel and degrades the uh, fibrinogen. And there's a pretty good publication that I um, show here. If you're going to read one, that might be the one you want to read. The recommended dose is 2,000 fibrin degradation units per day. And they suggest that you take it at bedtime because you're lying down and your blood is a little sluggish overnight. And that's when a clot is most likely going to form if you're sitting around all the time or if you're sleeping. All right, so here we're going to get into the mast cells. So this, again, is a angiolipoma, and each of those brown dots with the arrows are all mast cells that are within that angiolipoma. And normally, you'll, you'll see a mast cell in, in a fat biopsy, but they're kind of hard to find, so there usually are not many of them, certainly not this number. And mast cells are tanks. I mean, they're, they're releasing, you know, rapid fire. They're throwing out bombs. And one of the bombs they like to throw out is histamine. And histamine causes your blood vessels to dilate and leak. So having mast cells around is not a great thing if you're trying to keep your blood vessels from leaking. They also secrete tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is one of the well, most well-known inflammatory mediators in the body. So they're generating inflammation, they're generating leak, they're damaging tissue. So having them around is not a great idea. And what do mast cells make you do? Itch, right? They also make you flush, and they make you swell. So we don't only see mast cells in angiolipomas. We also see mast cells in normal obesity. So these are uh, cell mediators, hormones that you're going to see in 
the adipose tissue of someone who's lean, and these are the med some of the mediators that you're going to see in someone's fat tissue um, where obesity is present, and you can see that mast cells are included in that. So when you develop any kind of increased fat, you are likely going to have an increase in the number of inflammatory cells, and that includes mast cells. So how do you reduce mast cell symptoms? Some e easy things to do include baby aspirin with approval of your healthcare provider, because um, there's a nurse's study that they did and they covered up the word aspirin and they gave them this new drug and said, would you ever prescribe this drug to your patients? And the nurses said, never, never. And then they revealed that it was aspirin. So aspirin does have side effects, including bleeding. Non-sedating antihistamines, like over-the-counter that you can buy at the drugstore, like Allegra, Zyrtec, Claritin. Uh, vitamin D is a mast cell stabilizer. Many, many, many of you, I'm sure, have low vitamin D and are on vitamin D supplementation, me included. So if you make sure that your vitamin D is well within normal limits, then you're stabilizing your mast cells. Also, there's a medication called gastrochrom. A lot of our immune system is in our gut. This gastrochrom is a mast cell stabilizer, so you take it before you eat because you excite your immune system every time you eat, and then you take it at bedtime to keep your immune system quiet at night. So I also wanted to talk about this paper uh, uh, that came out recently. It's called Successful Treatment of Durkheim's Disease by Transcutaneous Electrical Stimulation. And this generated a ton of emails in the Durkheim's community to me. Like, hey, should I be doing this? This is, sounds really, really great. And I do agree, I, I love electricity. I think electricity, <laughs> electricity helps move your lymphatics. Um, and electricity helps um, move the gunk out from around your nerves so that your pain goes down. So I was very excited about this paper as well. And the electricity they used was called Frequency Rhythmic Electrical Modulation System, or FREMS. And it's a novel transcutaneous, so through the skin, electrotherapy. And FREMS is not new. So the fact that they used it in this patient with Durkheim's disease, they didn't invent it. It's been used in uh, diabetic painful neuropathy, as well as many other painful conditions, including uh, painful leg ulcers, myofascial pain syndrome, um, scleroderma, uh, or skin chases, scleroderma diabeticorum. So it sounds great. So the case is, this is a 57-year-old obese man, BMI 38, with recent diagnosis of Durkheim's disease. He'd had a partial gastrectomy for gastric cancer. He was clean, negative follow-up. He'd had his gallbladder removed, and he had a lot of disc herniations in his back, which um, is suggestive of our first case. He had a two-month history of fever, and he had diffuse and painful subcutaneous swelling with hard, thickened skin involving the entire body surface sparing only the head, neck, and the distal portion of the extremities. Do you see a word lipoma in there? Anyone see lipoma? Nodule, do you see nodule in there? No, so this is extensive fatty tissue changes and thickened skin. He'd also gained some weight, which is very easy to do when you're inflamed. Um, he had no evidence of a paniculitis, so his, uh, his skin was not red. He graded his pain as intolerable, if you touched him, it increased his pain. He could not lie on his back. He had trouble wearing just a t-shirt and he had trouble bending forward. He also found it difficult to sit. So he's not sleeping, right? He's, he's not happy, a happy camper. When they looked at his blood, he had an elevated C-reactive protein, which is a marker of inflammation. It's an acute phase reactant. His ANA was positive. 1 to 160, which isn't super, super high, but it suggests that um, the immune system is definitely activated, and he did not have hepatitis C. So they treated him with prednisone, 75 milligrams a day, which is just a ginormous dose, and then they tapered him down to 12.5, which is still a high dose, and his fever resolved, and he had a transient reduction in his pain. They gave him Tylenol, codeine, fentanyl, methotrexate. It didn't help him at all which is common in Durkheim's disease, and he started to functionally get worse, and he finally had to quit his job. So this is a picture of this guy, and this is actually before and after <coughs> treatment. So before on this side, after on this side, 
And I want to point out that it is my opinion, and I, you know, I did not personally examine this guy, that he has Madelung's disease. Um, there's no um, definite lipomas. Um, he's got the typical um, gyno gynecoid obesity that's a, that you see in men with Madelung's disease. He's got these subcutaneous um, rounded areas of fatty tissue on his abdomen. That's pretty classic for Madelung's disease. And he's got these bulges of uh, arm fat, again, also classic for Madelung's disease. And I had a patient who has classic, classic Madelung's disease who came to see me with a diagnosis of, of Durkheim's disease. And I, I, it was all I could do to keep my mouth shut and wait for you know, the whole appointment to be done before I said, you don't have Durkheim's disease, you have Madelung's disease. But interestingly, and the most important thing I think from this paper is that look at his fat reduced in size after he got treatment with electricity. And I don't know about the fat within his abdomen, but at least his subcutaneous fat decreased in size, which I think is fantastic. And this is where they put the electrodes on him. Um, you can see he's got a classic Madelung's uh, back here. But they put it all over, and they let him control it, which was awesome. And so he uh, usually hung around 180 volts. He gave himself 180 volts. He could give himself anywhere between 0 to 300. And so he did 180 volts on um, all over his body. So this is a full body treatment, which I think is a great idea. And this is showing his body weight at baseline. So 101 kilograms, he reduced down to 90 kilograms after six months. That's not bad. It's not a pill, which I really, really like. Um, his BMI decreased. Um, his uh, pain score um, from 0 to 100 decreased from 64 down to 17. That's huge. His physical functioning went from 0 to 85, where, where the higher numbers are better. Um, his, you know, everything, um, his vitality went up, his social functioning went up, his mental health went up, and that MRI showed a decrease in fat tissue. He didn't have any uh, major adverse events. He did get a slight burning sensation and skin redness at the site of the electrodes. He might have been reacting to the pad or the gel, and they all resolved within a few hours after he got his treatment. So I think the um, clinical benefits of the FREMS treatment may be transient, but I think they're good. You're going to have to do multiple sessions for it to be efficacious, and he underwent sessions for six months. Uh, improvement in pain may also be due to a placebo effect on the natural history of the disease. Not my words. This is from the paper. Um, so they felt like um, because they were paying attention to him and doing something for him, he felt better. Uh, so they, um, because of that, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if a reviewer made them write that, um, they need additional studies. I called the company, and they are not wanting to do studies on Durkheim's disease right now, but there is uh, the same group that had this patient is interested in uh, doing research on more patients with Durkheim's disease. So that's good news. I also wanted to, uh, we saw some MRI pictures of lipedema. This is an MRI picture of a patient uh, with Durkheim's disease, and you can see that um, we're looking at uh, up at her leg, and you can see all this white area here is fluid. And she's got just a ton of fluid right there in that medial upper thigh bulge that we talked about yesterday. So um, this is a paper that's documenting edema within Durkheim's disease fat tissue. So if, you're, if someone tells you you can't have edema if you have Durkheim's disease, you've got a published paper that you can show them. Yes, there is. And this is a uh, MRI of a um, and it's going to be really hard for you to see, I think, of a patient who's got nodular Durkheim's disease. And you can see these nodules are all sitting right under the skin. So right under these little white nodules, all right under the skin. And that, again, makes me think that Durkheim's disease is a connective tissue disorder. This one you could probably see a lot better. You see those nodules here? So right on, they're not deep, they're not attached to the muscle in this particular case, they're attached to the skin. So final conclusions. So Dr. Durkham noted classic symptoms of Durkham's disease, including pain that occurs with nodules that can spread throughout the body. 
I really do think that Durkheim's disease is a connective tissue disorder, and that we should not be thinking that Durkheim's is just painful lipomas, but the skin is involved, there's collagen that's involved, and there's elastic tissue that's involved as well. We also have to remember that it's not just the lipomas that are painful. There is an involvement of the neurological system. The most common thing that can happen is a neuropathy, and that means that the small fibers in the skin are dying off. I think if you do have neurological symptoms and signs, you need to bring this to the attention of your healthcare provider, and you can ask them for a skin biopsy to confirm, especially if all the other tests required by, by Blue Cross Blue Shield are negative. And we also, I'd also like you to remember that angiolipomas have a lot of dead tissue in them, and that perhaps we can improve and decrease the amount of dead tissue by using medications and supplements that reduce fibrin clots. And finally, I think that the FREMS, or any kind of electricity, if you have a TENS unit, TENS units I think are beneficial for pain in Durkheim's disease. But any kind of electricity that you can use may be helpful for reducing pain and fat tissue, right? We saw a fat tissue reduction with electricity. So next time there'll be a booth out here with an electrical chamber and you're gonna go in there and mm. <laughs> So I wanna thank, um, give some big thanks to Chris Ussery because he coordinated all of our subject visits, sample collection, and really just about, he does everything else. And Sarah Algadban for histology, yay Chris. Uh, Sarah for her um, excellence in histology and hopefully um, we'll be presenting her papers next time. And I also wanna thank each and every one of uh, the participants here at this conference who participated in research and everyone who flew into Tucson or lives near Tucson or drove into Tucson who donated their time and tissue and understanding and love to the TREAT program. Thank you very much.